We visited the most dangerous city in America, according to a study published by Neighborhood Scout, and the experience was not quite what I had imagined. In fact, I learned quite a bit about crime, and it made me ponder some things I never thought too deeply about after I visited. In this video, I want to go over that experience and talk about what it was like and provide some thoughts for you to think about. First, it's really helpful to think about some issues with crime data as a whole before we really get into Bessemer, Alabama specifically and that study mentioned. Crime data, which I'm talking about in this video, is really FBI crime data. And in order for crime to end up in the FBI's crime data, three things need to happen. First, the crime has to be reported to or observed by the police. The police must accurately record the crime in their internal database and the respective police department has to share its data with the FBI. Now, there are lots of potential issues with FBI crime data, including things like underreporting by victims. It's, it's said that only about half of violent crime victims ever report to the police, and it's at an even lower reporting rate for property crimes. In other cases, reporting can be affected by things like automated reporting methods used by retailers and even current events. So sometimes the reporting rates are somewhat seasonal, there's also the fact that some agencies actually don't report anything at all. In fact, over the past 20 years, around 15 to 30 percent of police departments have not reported their crime. And this has been extra bad with the new changes in reporting that just went into existence just in the last couple of years. So some of the reporting issues can come down to accidental errors, but others are traceable to police discretion. So one police department might classify something as a simple assault while another might classify it as an aggravated assault. There's also the potential for bias or some type of manipulation to come into the picture. So there are incidents where police departments downgraded crimes in order to avoid extra scrutiny, in other cases where they may have upgraded crimes to get allocated more resources. So for these reasons, I don't think you can always completely depend on FBI crime data to give you a precise picture of what's going on in a specific region or area. I'm not saying that the crime rates from the FBI are completely useless or that they are always flawed. I think it's just a matter of understanding that you often need to be critical of this data and understand that there could be limitations to it or in some cases it could be the product of some type of deliberate misrepresentation. So now let's talk about the actual study that showed Bessemer as the most dangerous city. So the first thing is Bessemer is labeled as the most dangerous city, and I think we all agree that a definition of most dangerous could be very subjective. For example, you could include things like traffic statistics, which a lot of people would care about. You know, people would want to know how much of a risk are you of getting into a major traffic accident because people in that city just drive really crazy. Uh, there are things like natural disasters, which for some people, you know, that might be the thing that they're most concerned about is what are the odds of a catastrophic flood or earthquake hitting the city? With those things said, I think most of the time when we're thinking about a dangerous city, we're talking about crime and specifically violent crimes. I don't really have an issue of basing this determination on violent crime, just as long as we sort of remind ourselves that dangerous is a subjective term. So in this study, Bessemer, Alabama comes in with a violent crime rate of 33 per 1,000 people, which puts it at the number one slot. So this is obviously going on a per capita basis, and that's why it's not going to have a super huge city with a lot more crime as the number one spot. So some people saw my reels on this and they were like, oh, how is Chicago not number one? How is LA not number one? They have way more crime. Well, it's per capita. So it's judging the basically the density of crime. Now, personally, I do like per capita numbers because it helps to compare smaller places to larger places. But there are still some limitations and some things to think about when looking at per capita data. The first thing you have to think about is that the way these official city limit boundaries are drawn up can affect the way these cities end up on lists. So I'm going to show you an illustration here and you can see basically we have two different metro areas and let's say they're exactly the same in terms of, you know, their population and everything like that. Two hypothetical metro areas and the black circle is the border around each metro area. Now see that red square? Now let's call that the official city limits of the city. In one instance, you can see it's a lot smaller and the other one it's a lot larger. So now look at these little grid, little like neighborhood grids basically, and focus on the one in the middle, which is kind of this orangish red color. And then you'll see these green ones on the outer edges, right? So let's say the orangish one is, you know, uh, urban area right in the heart of a city, downtown area. And then the green are suburbs and the green have the lower crime rates, the orange has the higher one. 
If a city is designed so that the boundaries are confined closely around the core of, you know, the urban area where the crime is, then that's obviously going to have a worse per capita rate than one that includes these suburban areas with lower crime. So the way that we draw up cities across the states is really different in a lot of cases. So some cities may be more expansive and have these suburban areas included while others don't. And the way that we talk about cities, oftentimes we refer to, you know, metro areas. We'll use them somewhat interchangeably sometimes if we're talking about, you know, St. Louis or Memphis or whatever. So you have to think about how the official city limits are drawn up when you're talking about the dangerous cities because it can really determine that per capita rate and that's why you don't want to just make a a broad conclusion about these rates you want to actually go and look at the way the city is designed because in both of these cases you could say um, you know they're they have the same level of danger but it just depends on where you are right if you're in the suburbs you're going to be fine but if you're in the heart of the city it's going to be worse Another issue with the study is the threshold. So this study cuts off cities at 25,000 people and Bessemer, Alabama has a population of 26,000. So it's just right on the threshold of being excluded in this study. And the thing about these smaller cities is that because they are so small, the amount of crime in a city in a given year can really cause spikes that make a city just kind of rise from obscurity to maybe at the top of one of these lists. And I know this because I grew up in a pretty bad neighborhood in Texas, and so I kind of have an idea of how crime can sometimes develop over the span of a few years. So sometimes you have these bad neighborhoods where things happen on a you know regular basis, like you have break-ins and people doing crazy stuff like throwing cinder blocks through other people's windows. But it's bad, but it's not necessarily a war zone. However, the tensions can start to mount over time. And in my case, it was between the Bloods and the Crips, and they were sort of like going back and forth and just doing, you know, like really crappy things to each other. But after a couple of years, those tensions just really mounted. And all of a sudden, there was this like huge influx of like really bad crime. There were drive-bys and shootings and just kind of like craziness going on in the streets. And so in that case, that crime rate for that small city could have really shot through the roof just based on the, you know, my neighborhood and the surrounding ones alone because of this burst of crime that happened. So it's just to say that for the smaller cities, these swings in crime could have a more outsized impact on their per capita crime rate and kind of shoot them up towards the top. And obviously the cutoff at 25,000 people is arbitrary. So if they had lowered it to say 20,000 people, you may have had some other cities that landed on the list. So just important to kind of remember the arbitrariness of the parameters as well. So the bottom line for me is that crime data does not always tell the whole story or even an accurate story, but it could still be useful in my opinion. And lists like the most dangerous city are absolutely clickbait marketing, but I still would say that they are not as useless as some people make them out to be. I look at it as more of just a guidepost to tell you that this city has some type of problematic areas with crime, because in my opinion, a city just doesn't end up on one of these lists for no reason. And so it's more of a thing of just looking at a list like this and saying, hey, okay, if you're thinking about visiting here, if you're thinking about moving here, you need to be aware that there are probably some areas that you're gonna, uh, that are gonna make you very uncomfortable with their crime levels. So just be aware and alert to that, but you still might be able to find some areas that are very livable in the vicinity of the city. Okay, so with all of that out of the way, now let me get into our actual visit to Bessemer. So it was a very short visit. We just pulled in and basically explored the city for a little while. We didn't stay overnight or anything. We just kind of drove up and down the streets, checking everything out. For the most part, I have to say, it just felt like a pretty quiet place. There were a few neighborhoods that we went through where I felt like, okay, this may be a place where I could see a lot of crime happening and it didn't really feel comfortable just recording people like, you know, sitting out in front of their porch looking at me. You know, we did hear some police sirens going on, but for the most part, it still didn't seem that bad. Um, the one thing that did stick out to me was that there were a lot of abandoned buildings. So they had these old like train station type buildings, depots. They had an old high school football stadium, even a shopping mall that were just completely abandoned. And I don't necessarily attribute those to crime because you know this city did have a really nice economy going on when it had its mining and its steel industry booming, say in the middle of the 1900s and maybe a couple of decades after that. But um, because the industry left, I think a lot of this 
you know, kind of abandonment of buildings and deterioration happened. So I think this has more to do with post-industrialization than crime, although I did see some residential houses that looked like, you know, they had been burned and you know, who knows what had happened in those cases. But that was something that stuck out to me. People mentioned how there are some nicer areas of the city and I completely believe that that's probably the case. I know there's like a water park, so I figured there are some nicer areas. And we did see some pockets that looked pretty good. We saw some really nice homes here and there, but we just didn't stumble into an area that was just filled to the brim with like really nice houses or anything. One thing that is pretty cool about Bessemer is that because it's not the war zone that you might expect, you can go there, visit and check out some of the things that they have to offer. And they do have a few things that I think would be interesting for a traveler to check out. One is they have this little history museum. Unfortunately, it was closed the day that we visited, but I actually was really looking forward to learning more about the city and its, you know, industry and everything, the changes that have taken place. There was a nice little park. We kind of strolled around around Christmas time. It had this really big, nice uh, Christmas tree in it. And it was just nice. You're kind of taking a stroll. You know, you don't feel like you're going to get like shot just like walking your dog down the park or whatever. So there were some things to check out, but one of the major reasons why you want to go to Bessemer is to check out some of the culinary scene. One of the famous restaurants they have is Bright Star. It's actually the oldest restaurant in Alabama, and it's known for its snapper and gumbo. Opinions are a bit mixed from locals. Some people talk about how it's overrated, but um, that's the restaurant that I think is pretty cool just for the sake that it is the oldest restaurant. I think there's some like interesting murals or artwork inside that's also makes it interesting. Bob Sykes Barbecue is another place. People really rave about their desserts, especially their red velvet cake. So that's something to check out. And then they have some other places like King's Wings that you may want to go check out if you're in the mood for something like chicken wings. Bessemer, Alabama is also home to a lot of really noteworthy people. It's actually a pretty surprisingly long list of people that you probably would recognize. So you have a few famous athletes. Heisman winner Jameis Winston is from here. And I know a lot of people hate on Jameis Winston, but from a purely athletic accomplishment standpoint, you have to acknowledge the fact that he was the first true freshman to win the Heisman. Um, Johnny Menzel, who Johnny Football obviously is a, a big phenom, but he was the first you know redshirt freshman to win it. Um, but uh, Jameis Winston also won the national championship his freshman year, so you know that's still a pretty big accomplishment in my opinion. But I mean, probably the most famous athlete from Bessemer is Bo Jackson. A lot of people would consider him to be the most gifted um, in terms of just natural athletic gift that a professional athlete had. There are like these crazy stories about things he used to do, like jumping over a house and things like that. Um, so, um, and by the way, I do know some people do dispute that those two are from Bessemer because they distinguish between where they went to high school and where they were from. but. Uh, I heard from some locals and they basically said that they are like they would claim Bessemer as like their home, even though they may have went to schools that were like next door, or, you know, in a city just nearby. I'll let other people make that call. I'm not, you know, I don't know the true story on that, but I just know what people told me. But there are some other notable people as well. Glenn Shaddix, who uh, I believe was in The Nightmare Before Christmas and quite a few other movies. He is from Bessemer, Alabama as are a few other famous like photographers and artists. So quite the lineup of notable individuals from uh, Bessemer. And you also cannot forget Gucci Mane, obviously one of the biggest rappers now, is also from Bessemer, Alabama. So with all of that said, what did I learn from this visit? Well, I learned that labeling an entire city as dangerous is often problematic because to accurately gauge the danger from crime, you need to really be looking at a city from a granular level, such as neighborhood crime data, and you can't underestimate the need for an on the ground experience to really get a feel for the city yourself. At the same time, while crime data can provide an incomplete story of an area, I don't think it's a good idea to ignore it or completely diminish it. So after I published a reel on Bessemer, Alabama, I got a lot of comments saying that uh, you know Bessemer is not that bad. Bessemer, you know, the crime is really not that bad. And I agreed with the, I fully agree with the comments in the sense of it didn't feel that bad at all you know so at the end of the day i mean there is this study that shows the crime rate of 33 per 1000 people for violent crime so i feel like you have to acknowledge that but you know i do feel like some people also went a little bit too far by trying to downplay that crime data so one person was trying to kind of like mock the data or mock mock my reel by saying like oh you know hey 
there's a kid playing in his front yard um, in Bessemer, Alabama. Someone called the police. It's so dangerous. But like literally, it may have been that same day he made that comment, maybe a day or two before. There was a five-year-old kid who was shot and killed in his front yard. He was sitting on his front porch getting a haircut and someone came up and shot him, shot another man who I, I believe he survived or was in critical condition. Very obviously tragic and heartbreaking story. But whenever I saw that person trying to, you know, downplay the crime in the area, and then I, and specifically for, you know, a kid in his front yard, and then I see this story that came out like right at that same time, it kind of woke me up to the fact of, hey, you know, we have to find this balance of being able to acknowledge the reality of crime, of not trying to constantly downplay crime and the crime rates. We still need to be critical of the data and understand that it does portray an incomplete story a lot of times. But, you know, that's really why I love traveling, because you get to go places and it gets you thinking about these things. Like I never would have wrestled with these ideas of what does a crime rate really say about a city and how should you let that type of data affect the way that you travel or the places that you choose to live. So at the end of the day, I would definitely go back and visit Bessemer. I would try more of the restaurants. I want to see that museum. And at the same time, I would use common sense. I would probably stay out of some of the areas that we drove through. Um, but I would not feel like, you know, I'm like risking my life just checking out the city. I think you just need to use common sense and not try to completely throw out the crime data just because it could be flawed or it could be incomplete. I think at the end of the day, cities with high crime reputations do have those reputations for a reason we just don't want to generalize too much about them and try to have an on-the-ground experience ourselves